Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Danback. On this edition, we'll trace the history of fiber arts, learn about a brave Mandan chief, and listen to the mellow, acoustic sounds of a Fergus Falls musician. The rugged beauty of the dells of the St. Croix River, which straddle the water between Minnesota and Wisconsin, has drawn visitors since the 1860s. But in 1895, when this tourist destination was threatened, Minnesota and Wisconsin were galvanized to establish the first cooperative state parks in the country. We are at Wisconsin Interstate Park in St. Croix Falls, Wisconsin. This is Wisconsin's oldest state park. It was established in the year 1900. We are at Interstate State Park in Taylor's Falls, Minnesota. This state park has a history that spans back to 1895 when it was first created. A lot had been happening in the River Valley leading up to the establishment of the interstate parks, including uh, beaver and fur trapping and trading, a long logging history, um, excavation of the rock in this area, and already the start of tourism. So citizens uh, thought it would be in their best interests of both communities to preserve the scenic beauty of the Dells of the St. Croix River specifically to protect some basalt cliffs along that riverway that have been here for over a billion years. One of the treats is to explore what was carved into those basalt cliffs many years later, and those are our glacial potholes. We talk a lot about the Ice Age here at Interstate Park. Meltwater from that Lake Superior lobe of ice had formed a lake at the ice margin called the Glacial Lake Duluth. Um, that meltwater had nowhere to go, and all that meltwater began crashing down through this valley. This river was moving so quickly that in backwaters or in eddies, the current would begin to swirl, forming whirlpools. And glacial debris that had been picked up by the moving ice of the glacier would get trapped in the swirling water of the whirlpools, and that debris would begin to swirl around and around, um, forming a liquid drill, which would actually begin to drill into the solid basalt below, leaving behind, eventually, some very smooth-sided, um, round holes in the rock. These are known as glacial potholes. And those are a real treat. You can walk above them, around them. There's even a pothole that you can walk inside of. When you come here to Interstate Park, you immediately see these stone structures. And you just get that feel of the history of the park. And those big blocky structures and the big log beams um, really kind of feel like you're transporting back in time a little bit. It was the Civilian Conservation Corps and the men of Camp Interstate that developed Interstate Park and made it uh, available to park users. The so CCC workers that we had here on the Minnesota Interstate State Park side were coming from the camp based out of the Wisconsin Interstate State Park side. Their charge was to establish the park without harming any of the natural scenery. So they didn't use bobcats and backhoes and large dump trucks and things. They did the work by hand. The stone that was used in all of these buildings is the, the natural basalt rock that we have in this area along the St. Croix River. They uh, learned from some of the Native American um, method of removing this rock. Um, here they would start a fire on the rock. They would keep that fire burning for perhaps 24 or 48 hours. Once that rock was good and hot, they had a bucket brigade of men. They would actually pass buckets of cold water from either our Lake of the Dalles here in the park or from the St. Croix River. They would dash it on the hot rock. It would um, shatter the rock enough so that they could pry it apart using crowbars and other hand tools. They would remove that rock from the path. Then they would bring in crushed trap rock to line the trail. And then in areas where um, erosion might be a problem or safety might be a concern, they would place stone stairs using the same uh, basalt rock. And I'm told that some of these um, stone stairs weighed up to two tons. 
So a tremendous amount of work um, that we're still enjoying today. The St. Croix River Valley is a very diverse place. So if you're here in the springtime, we have a wonderful show of wildflowers. We have a lot of spring warblers that migrate through at that time of year. If you're here in the fall, the fall color display is absolutely beautiful. The scenery from those basalt cliffs at the north end of the park is just stunning. So it's a beautiful place to take pictures. If you go to the south entrance of our park, we have 37 campsites, so camping is fun here. We also have a large picnic area and about four and a half miles of trails to explore and enjoy. There is so much to see and do in a very small package here. Interstate Park started out a half an acre in size. It's grown to almost 1,400 acres. People come to Wisconsin Interstate Park and they are surprised by the rocky terrain that we have here by the River Gorge, um, referred to as the Dalles of the St. Croix. There's opportunities for camping. We have about 85 family campsites. There are picnic areas, uh, nine miles of hiking trails. There's a lake, Lake of the Dalles, that provides an opportunity for swimming. There's canoeing opportunities, boating opportunities, fishing on both the St. Croix River and Lake of the Dalles. As far as the wildlife, what you might expect to find here, you will. Um, White-tailed deer, some black bear, uh, coyotes, foxes. As far as birds, we have probably 250 different species of birds that will be here at one time or another, perhaps migrating through along the San Croix River corridor or um, nesting or overwintering here. It's a unique partnership that we have. We're all working towards the same common goal. I'm hoping to invite visitors here and um, educate them about this area and instill in them an appreciation of the very unique area that can be found um, right here in the St. Croix River Valley. Aliza Novacek Olson's interest in fiber arts stems from her love of history, specifically the role of women throughout the years. She takes pride in creating a piece of clothing from the fiber that comes from the animals she raises on her ranch in Roseau, Minnesota. I just kind of always liked creating things and I have a fondness for learning how women used to do things in the past. I started out with my grandmother. Grandma always crocheted very fast <laughs> at crocheting, so I had to just watch. And then she gave me a hook and I started crocheting. Well, today I kind of dabble in a little bit of everything. I've learned spinning now. I've done that for about five years and I love it. When you do spinning, you make your yarn so you need fiber for it. And that's very difficult to find. So I started thinking, well, all my life I've lived with animals. We have cattle, we have horses. So I got a few alpacas. And that's where I started working with the fiber is my need for wanting to have accessible fiber and to know what I get. And the most fun part is that I get to raise it myself like people did in the past. You have to admire how people did things in the past because they were not a wasteful people. They've used bone, they've used antler, they used all the pieces of the materials that they used for other purposes. The animal skins. People just started working with the fibers with their hands and they started twisting and then they used sticks and rocks to help with the twisting to make it go faster. And when you're making yarn that way, it's a slow process. So your yarn that you make is shorter lengths of yarn. That's probably where null bending came in because its uniqueness is that you work it with one needle and you work with short lengths of yarn. We find that null bending has been well over 10,000 years ago that people were using it. That was maybe one of the first ones besides spinning. I spin on mostly a spinning wheel. It's very relaxing. I always love working with something that's old and it has been used in the past. One of my favorites then is my husband's great grandma's wheel. That's a fun one to spin on. It's a little bit different. It's quite small, but it's a special one. 
I have a great wheel. The great wheel was invented somewhere around 1250, so it was in the early Middle Ages. For a good portion of history, the great wheel was the wheel that was used up until about the late 1700s, early 1800s. The great wheel doesn't have the treadle like you see on most wheels. It doesn't have the flyer. It has a spindle. So like many other objects, there's different inventions that come along the way that made things more efficient. And that's where you see the Saxony wheel when the flyer and the treadle were invented. The flyer wheel has a different system than what a spindle is. The flyer wheel has a bobbin on it that goes around and it had a lot of benefits to it. It was faster, easier to fit it in the house. And then after the flyer came the trendle, so you didn't have to use your hands so much. When you're using your hands, one has to be on the wheel to keep it going, and one is to draft your fiber out. When they got the trendle, they could use both their hands for drafting fiber. Working with the fiber, it has special meaning for me. I enjoy history. I especially have a fascination in learning how women did things in the past. I don't think a person really realizes how much they did and the skill and the talent that they had and the time invested in things that they did for their families until you actually sit down and do some of it. There's a lot of importance to homespun that we don't think about, say in the Revolutionary War, how women were political. We hear about the Boston Tea Party and we hear about fighting for our freedom from Britain. Some of that could not have happened without the women. Women refusing to use tea. And one of the big things is women refuse to purchase things from Britain. It was very patriotic for women to sit at home and spin their own yarn, make their own clothing, and not purchase it. And when you think about the colonies and the amount of women there that all of a sudden quit buying, that's a lot of political and economic power, or what they did to promote society. My grandfather, who influenced me a lot in my love of history, fought in World War I. So the soldiers were having problems with trench foot. And I remember him telling these stories about socks, and he said, Oh, those trenches, you're always wet, you're always cold. And he said, if you didn't have enough socks, you'd have to roll your socks up and put them under your armpits just to kind of dry them so you can put them back on. Well, the problem was that the women were hand knitting most of these socks. Well, that takes a long time to knit a pair of socks by hand. So the Red Cross stepped in and purchased circular sock machines, and then they looked for volunteers to make the knitting of the socks. And then they had a quota to fill that each woman that had a sock machine in their home would make these socks, send them to the Red Cross, and then they would ship them to the soldiers. It played an important role in the health of the soldiers in World War I. And I never realized that until I started working with some of these knitting machines. I like to do things the way that they have been and try to preserve the old traditional ways and try to remember when you work with these things, who did it in the past, why they did it, how they come up with it, the purposes for the things that they did and just preserve the history that come along with all these things. The Mandan chief forebears was given his name after a battle in which he charged his enemy with the strength of forebears. He was a brave and courageous man and a distinguished war leader. His generosity and fearlessness in battle gained him the respect of the Mandan people who honor his memory even to this day. It is one of the primary questions we get here at the museum. Why is everything around here called forebears? What was forebears? Who was forebears? We have the forebears bridge, we have the forebears casino, we have forebears village and sometimes they even call us the Forebears Museum. People are sometimes a little bit surprised to learn that there were two chief forebears, or two warriors forebears, the Mandan forebears and then the Hiratsa forebears. They lived at different times in, our, in the history. 
of our tribe, the Mandan forebears being the earlier of the two. The reason that the Mandan forebears is so revered is because of his reputation as being a great warrior and defending the rest of the tribe from enemies and people that would be seeking to harm them. The Hirata forebears is known for being a great leader and negotiator at the Fort Laramie meeting in 1851. The life of the Mandan forebears began probably about 1800. At the time he was born, there was already a tremendous change in the society of the Mandan people. Prior to that time, they probably lived a fairly uh, peaceful life along the Missouri River. They were planters, farmers planted huge crops, lived permanently in earth lodge villages, and had a highly developed social structure. About that time, the influx of the Europeans began to impact on forebears and its people. He probably saw a lot of change. He saw the coming of the white man. He saw the harassment of the Sioux. That's when the warfare between the tribes on the Great Plains began. Everybody had allies and enemies, so Forbears was born into that as a young man and distinguished himself then as a warrior. The warrior status was very highly thought of. That's probably his legacy now as a very distinguished warrior and a protector of the people and the village where he lived. The most interesting thing about forebears is how did he get that name? With Indian people, a person could have several names. They could have a name at birth, they could have a name when they became a young person, they could distinguish themselves in some manner and get another name. Forebears acquired his name from the fact that he was a great warrior. In a battle he had with one of the enemy tribes, they were amazed at how he could fight, and they called him that he fights almost like four bears together. That would be quite a strong fighter, I would say. <laughs> he was also noted as being very congenial. When the white man first arrived, he was very hospitable and very welcoming. In June, of 1837, then a boat came up the river and they had a sick man on board and he was left at the Mandan village and they said, we'll pick him up on our way back down. Well, he had smallpox. The Mandan people were told, leave your villages, outrun this epidemic, outrun this germ. They couldn't because they had permanent villages, they had gardens, they had fields. So they stayed, which was probably the worst thing they could do because the earth lodges were not conducive to getting rid of the smallpox germ. So as a result, almost the entire population of the Mandan people, and forebears being one of them, that perished in the epidemic. There's a speech, sort of a farewell speech, where he talks about, I've always been a friend to the white man, we've welcomed him, we've given him food, we've given him lodging, and Look what he's done to us. In 1832, there were two very prominent artists, George Catlin and Carl Bodmer. Now, Carl Bodmer was accompanied Prince Maximilian. He's an explorer. Carl Bodmer did a lot of sketching and painting while he was on this journey. George Catlin came from back east. He was also interested in making sketches of Indian people before they disappeared. Both Catlin and Bodmer did artist sketches and, and portraits of forebears. So we have those. We know they're very well done. Catlin and Bodmer did only the Mandan forebears. The Hidatsa forebears would have been perhaps too young or still a child. So we, we don't have any images of the Hidatsa forebears like we do of the Mandan forebears. Forebears to me signifies a time when the Mandan people were probably at the pinnacle. Ideally, he represents that kind of lost 
society that everybody's trying to acquire. The reason it's important to remember forebears is for any historical reason that we remember Thomas Jefferson or we, re we remember George Washington, to really have a full understanding of why we're here and how we're here. We gotta look back and see the path, the journey. The Indian history is a big part of it. For over 30 years, Anthony Miltich has been performing his acoustic style of music throughout the Midwest. He's produced several CDs and draws from his own life to create original music and lyrics. Screaming at the bullfight What a strange delight Betting on the game Hope you win tonight Going to the movies Give them what they want Ladies in their high heels High heels can be bought It's a surreal life experience It's a real life experience It's a real life experience Hey, hey, hey Staring at the pictures, the galleries, the street, singing down the freeway with no one in the back seat. Meet me at the motel, tied up from nine to five. Get what I've been missing, bring you back to a life from surreal life experience. It's a real life experience It's a real life experience Hey, hey, hey Bring them to their feet Working out the details I'm squirming in my seat But I'm working at the car wash Singing me the blues Me don't need no car wash Somebody shine my shoes Surreal life It's a surreal life experience it's a real life experience, hey, hey, hey. Catching the stars as they fall And all of the things that are driving you crazy Won't really matter at all Hey, let's go up on the mountain tonight you can bring all your memories along We'll take all the very best times of our lives And set them down into a song And we'll stand on a peak overlooking the world And sing it as loud as we can Not one of the millions below us will hear it But won't the elation be grand Hey 
And we'll catch us a ride on the wings of an angel Flying too close to the ground And if she is flying away to forever Maybe we'll never come Down If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at prairiemosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Bob Dambach. And I'm Barb Gravel. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.